I'm sure we have all looked for cool shapes and objects in the clouds when we were younger. I know I did at least. But how do these cool shapes and objects form in the sky? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the sixth class in the meteorology series. We've now finished looking at the basic elements of the atmosphere. And we're going to be moving on to the more interesting weather aspect of meteorology. In this class, we're going to be taking a look at how clouds are formed and how we describe them. And this class requires a good understanding of how humidity works. So if you haven't done so, I'd recommend going back and watching the previous video all about humidity before getting started on this one. The fundamental concept behind why clouds form is due to condensation, which is the process of water vapor cooling to the point where it is no longer in gas form, but now in liquid form. This happens because the air cools down and the individual water molecules lose energy and start to be attracted to each other. And when the particles are close together, they form chains of these particles, which in on the atomic level is how liquid states are formed. So that's why we get liquid water when we cool down. The temperature at which this condensation occurs is known as the dew point. This is the temperature where the saturation vapor pressure, the amount of water, the air that can hold, the amount of water vapor the air can hold, reduces down to the point where it matches the actual amount of water in the air, known as the actual water vapor pressure. When the temperature of this dew point is above zero degrees Celsius, in this example, we've chosen 10 degrees Celsius, we would form it's the liquid water molecules in the air. If the dew point was below zero degrees Celsius, then we would sublimate, we would go through the sublimation process straight into the solid water state in ice form. Ice crystals form around impurities in the air. So if you're in the situation where there are very few impurities in the air, such as like smog particles or dust particles, then you can end up with something called supercooled water droplets. And these are just extremely cold droplets of water and they will only form into ice when an impurity is introduced. This can happen, for example, when an aircraft flies through a cloud full of supercooled water droplets. That aircraft is then the impurity in the air that the supercooled water droplets would need to form ice. And that could be maybe the leading edge of the wing, for example. When air rises, the pressure drops and so does the temperature as we get further and further from the surface. Because of the pressure drop, the air will also expand because there's obviously less pressure to push it all together. If we ignore the temperature reduction caused by moving away from the surface and only look at the pressure reduction, there is then a secondary temperature reduction, which is caused by the expansion of the air. This secondary temperature reduction happens all the time as parcels of air rise and fall. And it happens independently of this actual temperature changes caused by the surface being warmer than it is higher up. And this secondary temperature cooling process we call an adiabatic cooling process, adiabatic. So as a parcel of air rises and cools adiabatically due to that expanding air and dropping pressure, it does this at a rate of three degrees per thousand feet. So if we have a parcel of air rising up every thousand feet, that parcel of air will cool just because of this secondary effect by three degrees every thousand feet. This is known as the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So it's dry because it's below the saturated humidity. It's below a relative humidity of 100%. When it cools down to the dew point and the air now becomes saturated, it then cools adiabatically at a different rate, which is known as the saturated adiabatic lapse rate. And this is 1.8 degrees per thousand feet. The reason behind this difference is because as the water vapor starts to condense out into liquid form at the dew point, the heat is given off, heat is released in order to change it to this liquid state. And this heating effect, this heat being given off, um, adjusts the temperature from three degrees up to 1.8 there's that latent heat in the atmosphere that is stopping it from three degrees and moving it more towards 1.8. So hopefully you can start to see the way that clouds are formed. 
a parcel of air rises up and cools down adiabatically at the dry adiabatic lapse rate of 3 degrees per thousand feet. This is until it reaches the temperature where the air cannot hold any more water vapour in it and it becomes saturated, the dew point temperature. The water vapour then condenses out to form the beginnings of clouds and as the parcel of air continues to rise at the saturated adiabatic lapse rate of 1.8 per thousand feet, it paints more cloud as it goes, just a little paintbrush painting clouds as it goes. This means that you can estimate the cloud base if you know the current temperature and the dew point. In this example, we're going from a temperature of 16 degrees Celsius and we know that the dew point is four degrees Celsius. So it's a 12 degree change and we're doing three degrees every thousand feet. We can estimate that the cloud base is gonna be up at 4,000 feet. The actual height of the clouds will depend very much on the stability of the atmosphere, which we'll look at in a little bit. Fog or mist is just very low cloud and it is formed slightly differently to regular clouds. The main difference is that the adiabatic rising and expanding process doesn't occur because the air isn't rising, essentially. With fog, the air is cooled down because of a cold surface temperature through conduction and radiation heating and stuff like that. With fog, the air is cooled because of the cold temperature and that brings the saturation vapour pressure down until it meets the actual amount of water vapour pressure in the air, which is known as the dew point. At this dew point, all the water vapour in the air condenses out to form clouds. And the small water and ice particles are lifted and mixed through the air by wind and the cool surrounding air causes yet more water vapour to condense out. And depending on the temperature and the amount of mixing going on, fog can be a couple of feet off the ground to a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand feet even. The only difference between mist and fog is the levels of visibility inside it. Fog is considered the visibility less than a thousand metres and mist is when the visibility is less than 5,000 meters. So why does a parcel of air rise? The most basic one is considering warm air. So warm air rises because it expands, the volume increases, and that makes the density decrease. And less dense things float on top of more dense things. So hot air will rise because of this reason. Air can also be caused to rise by geographic features such as mountains, which is known as orographic rising. Another way that it can rise is when you reach the front of a colder band of air. Colder air is more dense and you come in, the air comes in, not you come in, the parcel of air comes in and it is, will automatically be less dense than a colder section of air. So it will rise up because of that. Depending on the relative density of the air, compared to its surroundings, it will either continue to rise, known as unstable air, it will descend, which is known as stable air, or it will stay exactly where it is in neutral equilibrium. The density of the surrounding air is also going to be dependent on temperature, such as the heating process that we saw. And the way that this works is that the rising parcel of air will cool at the dry adiabatic lapse rate or the saturated adiabatic lapse rate and we compare that to what is known as the environmental lapse rate. So this would be, um, if we were looking at our international standard atmosphere, this is the two degrees per thousand feet, but depending on the day and the conditions, this is going to be slightly different. So when we compare these two, we can find out if the saturated, sorry, if the rising parcel of air is more dense or less dense compared to its surroundings. And if it is less dense, it will continue to rise and if it is more dense, it will start to sink down and be more stable. So the best way to think about these stability in general is to compare the three main types. The first one is known as absolute stability. So this means that the temperature of the parcel of air must always be warmer than the environmental air surrounding it. So in this diagram here, we've used an environmental lapse rate of one degrees per thousand feet. This means that as a parcel of air rises, it will always be cooling down at a faster rate of either three degrees for the dry or 1.8 for the saturated. This means that wherever we look at the altitude, the rising parcel of air is always going to be 
colder and therefore more dense and it will tend to sink rather than rise. So for absolute stability, you need the environmental lapse rate to be lower than both the saturated and the dry adiabatic lapse rate. One degree, it needs to be below 1.8 in essence. The opposite case to this is absolute instability. This means that the temperature of the parcel of air must always be hotter than the surrounding environmental air to make it less dense and to rise up. This happens when the environmental lapse rate is larger than both the dry and saturated adiabatic lapse rate. So if we have, look at this example, and we have an environmental lapse rate of four degrees every thousand feet, then if we start off at a sea level temperature of 18, the rising parcel of air will reach a temperature of 12 degrees at 2,000 feet because it's three degrees every thousand feet, six degree difference, while the surrounding air will cool down to 10 degrees because it's cooling at four degrees every thousand feet. This means that our parcel of air that's rising is hotter and it's going to continue to rise. When the air becomes saturated, it then starts to cool at 1.8 degrees per thousand feet. And by the time we reach 4,000 feet, we're gonna be at 8.4 degrees. And by this point, the surrounding air is going to be all the way down at two degrees. So again, the rising parcel of air is warmer, it will continue to rise. The third type of stability is conditional stability. And this is con the condition in this case is whether the air is dry or saturated. So if the parcel of air is unsaturated, it will be colder than the surrounding air and it therefore sinks down. If the parcel of air is saturated, it will then become warmer than the surrounding air and keep rising. This will happen when the environmental lapse rate is between the dry and saturated adiabatic lapse rate. If we think about it in this example of two degrees for every thousand feet, then if we start at a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius, at 2000 feet, we're gonna be at four degrees Celsius and the surrounding air, the environmental lapse rate will be six degrees Celsius. So the rising parcel of air is more dense, it will tend to sink down. Once we become saturated, however, the temperature would only drop by 1.8 degrees and it would start to become, initially it will be a, uh, reducing the gap between them and eventually they will cross over and the environmental lapse rate and the saturated adiabatic lapse rate will flip in essence and you'll have the rising parcel of air always be warmer than the environmental lapse rate and it will continue to rise. As humans, we like to categorize things and clouds are no different. Generally speaking though, they fall into two broad categories which are either stable or unstable. Stable clouds will be what we call stratiform, which means very short, not very tall and very widespread. They are associated with light continuous precipitation, poor visibility and light turbulence because there's not that much air rising to cause that turbulence. The other type is unstable clouds, which are what we call cumuliform, which means they're tall and fluffy basically. They're also associated with showers of precipitation but good visibility, but again, we've got that moderate to heavy turbulence because there's lots of air rising to cause it. You'll never really hear cloud types de described as stable or unstable um, because there's a lot more specifics that we can get into, as you can see. The first one to talk about is the height of clouds. If the cloud base, the bottom of the cloud, is up to 6,500 feet, we call these low level. Mid level is 6,500 to 23,000 and high level clouds would be above 23,000. Then you can describe them again in terms of shape, in terms of cirrus, which means like quite wispy, or cumulus, which means that kind of fluffy shape that you would typically think of when you think of a cloud. And then you can combine and cross different types of these clouds to form the main categories here as I'll quickly run through. I've tried to draw them very badly, so it's probably, if you're very interested to see what type they are, just have a quick Google and you'll see that my drawings are rubbish. So starting off with the high level clouds, cirrus clouds, cirrostratus and cirrocumulus. So cirrus are like feathery sort of shapes. Um, cirrostratus are like mesh of fibers, kind of like a hazy sort of look. And cirrocumulus are small bubbly clouds. And they're all associated with relatively stable conditions, 
apart from the cirrocumulus, which will have little unstable patches where the little bubbles fall. And because they're so high up, there's no precipitation from any of them. Mid-level clouds have the prefix of alto. That's a good way to remember mid-level clouds. And they fall into either the stratiform or the cumuliform. Stratiform being the low, um, widespread, and cumuliform being more fluffy, more, um, more height to them. So alto stratus would be kind of grey-blue colours and quite large, associated with stable conditions and maybe give you some light continuous precipitation. Alto cumulus would be white grey with a few bumps of cumulus looking things and that means that there's going to be unstable little parts within it and that's associated with light showers as well. Then you come on to the low level clouds where you see a lot of precipitation. This is where most of the precipitation is formed. First one of these is nimbostratus, that's your kind of grey um, overcast condition sort of clouds associated with stable conditions and you'd get moderate continuous precipitation out of them. You can have stratus clouds as well. That's uh, a grey sort of layer. It'd be quite stable conditions and you get continuous light. So not as developed as a nimbostratus. Think of that as like a rain cloud, continuous rain all day. That may be a chance of rain. Stratocumulus clouds are patchy white and that means there's a few unstable patches and you have the potential for a continuous light precipitation. Cumulus clouds are your fluffy low clouds, good for you know spotting shapes in and stuff like that. Associated with unstable conditions and expect moderate showers if any precipitation. And then the daddy of them all, cumulonimbus clouds. These are your big high developed putting them in a low level cloud because of their low base, but they can extend all the way up to the levels of high level. They can be uh, all the way up to the uh, troposphere, tropopause even, uh, up to that you know, 36,000 feet. These can be very, very large clouds and they are storm clouds essentially, very unstable, associated with heavy showers, lightning, uh, not good conditions basically. So there's a whole world of cloud types and classifications to jump into if you're interested, but an important factor for us pilots is the amount of cloud cover. We would like to know if it's gonna be a blue sky day or overcast, so we basically know when to pack our nice sunglasses or not. It's also kind of useful for telling us the weather conditions at an aerodrome. So we will then be able to work out if we are able to land there or not. The cloud cover is reported to us in terms of eighths of the sky overhead the aerodrome, which is known as an octa. One eighth is equal to one octa. And if you imagine this is the, the land that the aerodrome takes up, just divide that into eight sections, and that is how you decide how much cloud cover is overhead an aerodrome. This is something we're going to get into a bit more in terms of when we look at weather reports towards the end of this uh, series. But just for now, know that it's eighths of the sky and there's different regions, uh, different ranges for the amount of cloud cover. You get zero, which is known as clear sky, sky clear, SKC is given a little designator on weather reports. One to two is few, three to four is scattered, five to seven is broken, and eight is overcast. And if the sky is more than 50% covered, so these bottom two, you call it a cloud ceiling, whereas if it's the uh, below 50% ones, zero, one, well, not zero, but one to two or three to four, you would call that a cloud base. So you would see a report on aerodrome, it would tell you various weathers, and it would say uh, there's few clouds at 1,500 feet. So you could say the cloud base is at 1,500 feet. In summary then, so condensation happens at the dew point, and this is where the saturation vapor pressure reduces to the actual vapor pressure that we have in the air and the water starts to condense out. If the dew point is lower than zero, then the water can sublimate straight into ice, and these ice crystals will form around impurities. If there's no impurities, it will sublimate, uh, well, it won't sublimate, it will just form very cold, extremely cold, supercooled water droplets, which will then form ice when introduced to an impurity such as an aircraft. Adiabatic cooling is the separate secondary cooling which is caused by the expansion of air. Think of it as like when you spray a can of, if you've got compressed air for cleaning out a computer or something like that, that gets very cold because the air is expanding and cooling down. The rate of cooling that happens with this expansion is dependent on the air and if it's dry or if it's saturated. 
the dry adiabatic lapse rate is 3 degrees per 1,000 feet, and the saturated adiabatic lapse rate is 1.8 degrees per 1,000 feet. Clouds form by these air pockets, these parcels of airs, cooling down to the dew point um, due to that dry adiabatic lapse rate, due to rising at that dry adiabatic lapse rate, and then they will continue to rise at the saturated adiabatic lapse rate. And depending on the environmental lapse rate, we'll either have stable conditions, instable conditions, or conditional conditions. So absolute stability is when the environmental lapse rate is lower than both the saturated and the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So that means it's going to be a value of less than 1.8 degrees per thousand feet. That means that the temperature of the air parcel is always going to be colder than the surrounding environmental air and therefore more dense and it's going to be uh, more stable. The opposite of that is absolute instability when the air environmental lapse rate is larger than the dry adiabatic lapse rate and the saturated adiabatic lapse rate and that means that a rising parcel of air the dry or saturated rising parcel of air is always going to be warmer than the surrounding air less dense it's going to rise up and then you've got conditional which is between the two and basically depends if the air is dry it will be more stable and if it's uh, saturated it will become it unstable clouds can be classified in loads of different ways and there's basically a few categories that you think of you think of a stable versus unstable stable low widespread clouds unstable quite high fluffy clouds then you think about the height you've got the low mid or high levels think about the shape you've got the stratiform shape or you've got the cumulo uh, cumulus shape then you've got the types of precipitation um, nimbo usually means wet i don't know what the actual word means but if it's nimbo stratus that means it's going to be moderate uh, moderate rain whereas if it's just a stratus it might not be quite as heavy rain classification is a bit weird because there's a lot of crossover and it's hard to tell when a stratus becomes a nimbo stratus there's no like defining thing so cloud classification come with a pinch of salt and then when we're looking at cloud reports or weather reports for aerodromes we'll see it described in terms of octas which means eighths and if the aerodrome is covered by no clouds you will say it's sky clear. If it's one to two of these eights that are covered, it would be few. Three to four is scattered, five to seven is broken, and eight is overcast. And when there's more than 50% of the uh, space over the aerodrome covered in clouds, it's known as a cloud ceiling. So broken and overcast are cloud ceiling, and not sky clear, because obviously there's none, but one to four, few and scattered, you would call that a cloud base.